Someone suggested to me that it's been so long since I've been here, I ought to introduce myself. But. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise read them, hear, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to the Way of the King, week 10. We are looking, as you know, at Ruth and 1 Samuel, and these are the goals of our study, to become more familiar with these persons, events, and especially the theology, because here's something I want you not to forget. When we're reading the text of the scripture, we're reading the story of the actions and the deeds of the Lord in the lives of a particular historical situation. That particular historical situation may or may not be like ours right now, but to the degree that it is, the Lord doesn't change, and you and I are his people the same as those people. They are just as faithful and just as scurrilous. What did I do? <laughs> do I have broccoli on my teeth? <laughs> <laughs> Those people are just as faithful and just as scurrilous as you and I are. They have the same struggles, and, and we pick up those themes. The Lord doesn't change. If he acted and was acting in that way to those people, then this same God who has claimed us as his people is acting the same way. And so when we're looking for theology, we're looking for the promises and the claims of God in that setting, and how is ours like it or different? So that there's a consistency here. That becomes key. <clears throat> and out of, out of that, then, we strengthen our confidence in the purposes and actions of the Lord of history. Eventually, Aaron would like us to see this in terms of how it reaches its pinnacle in Christ. And this, as you know, is our, um, our goal. We're going to end um, the week before Christmas with chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. And Aaron told me the other day he will want to be doing a little survey with you toward the end of this around early December and see after the first of the year, do you want to shift a topic and come back to the completion of this? Or do you want to pick up a different topic for a while or continue? So be thinking about that. I went to, uh, I told Barbara a day yesterday, I think it was, <clears throat> that um, I had an occasion to really dig back into some texts that have been very fruitful and helpful for me in thinking about this historical situation. And as the, the material was emerging and the things I want to talk to you about today, it, it tended to be just very informational, and I, was, and I was struggling with this. She said, what are you so fretting about uh, to me after supper last night? I said, I'm not finding a key of comfort and personal application for them. It's just largely this sort of background, um, not only for what we have been talking about, but for the weeks that are ahead until this morning. And, and it, I think I have found where the personal comfort, and we will see how that emerges. But I want to spend just a little bit of time to talk to you about what's going on in the whole circumstance that we know from, from history, we know it from archaeology, we're able to surmise these things seem to be going on at this time period. This is what we call the end of the Bronze Age, and what that means is the, the principal technology was relying on bronze for weapons and for everyday use. 
and there seems to have been in this couple hundred years from the 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 whole time period of the Joshua and the people coming into Canaan and the time period of the judges and now the time of Eli, Samuel, and Saul. <clears throat> this is called the end of the Bronze Age and it is the beginning of the Iron Age. We have extremely strong evidence that these things were happening. There were a whole series of natural disasters in the eastern Mediterranean basin. Uh, we seemed to, we were rather sure there were some major volcanic explosions and earthquakes. They're referred to not only in Jewish writings, but in other writings archaeologically that we have found. These things are extremely unnerving to people and extremely disruptive of government, society, and culture. As a result, several major powers that had been historically there were shaken. Um, we come to the end of the Sumerian civilization, which had been very dominant in this area. The Hittites pull back. Um, Egypt goes through major uh, changes of dynasty. There also seems as a result of lengthy drought, uh, not just a year or two, but maybe over a couple of decades, uh, there's widespread famine. And you must remember how different that culture is. If you don't harvest this year, you don't harvest for several years because you don't have any seed to plant. You can't go out and buy some or whatever. Um, there seems to have been widespread, widespread revolt in the cities of Canaan. They were controlled by the wealthy and the few. And all of a sudden, the people that they were controlling, who were Canaanites, rose up against them and the people who had been in charge of those cities either were killed or fled. And so when the, when the Israelites come into Canaan, they come into an area that for some period of time has been politically and socially and culturally devastated. And so the cities are weak. When these kinds of things happen, natural disaster, waning international power and local revolt, the trade routes get disrupted and all of a sudden uh, bandits and uh, that sort of thing are a total threat. Furthermore, the mining of materials and wealth and all the prosperity is just unraveled. That should sound familiar. Ask Ted. <laughs> because they love her because what we're going through in our culture and society as a result of COVID and the fuel uh, transition, everything else, widespread problems with supply. We ran into this and they keep threatening it. We also are keenly aware of changing weather patterns and that sort of thing, either short or long term. In the middle of this, the Phoenicians from the Western Mediterranean, the chronic enemy of Rome, has sailed to the east and they have established Phoenicia on the coast to the north, um, about a third of the way down from modern day Turkey. But some people associated with them or descended from them also form uh, the community that um, called the, Phil the Philistines. They're associated with the Phoenicians. And they establish in what, what's being fought over right now, Gaza. That was Philistia. And so it is comparable. You have these people very disruptive on the coast. Some weeks ago, I showed you this, um, how do you govern a people for the sake of their care? And there's no one particular kind of government 
that God says, use this kind of government. These are the possibles. But at the time of 1 Samuel, what had been the government for the Israelites after their advent into Canaan was a confederation. The tribes really kind of stuck to themselves in inhabited particular areas. I will show you maps shortly. <clears throat> and I will show you the geographical difficulty of this. <coughs> Excuse me. Confederate, confederation government is entirely like what, the, uh, what we had after the end of our revolt from England and before the signing of the Constitution. And so we were a group of united colonies or united states. Uh, but there was not a strong central authority to give some direction to all of this. As a result, that we had all kinds of problems with trade and taxes and other sorts of things. And it was not working out well at all. That we had no central army in terms of protection and so forth. Now, theocracy was, was a part of this then. These two kind of operated in concert, socially, um, in terms of trade, uh, local justice, um, local revolt and protection. Each tribe kind of depended on themselves. And once in a while, the tribes, either several of them got together, or maybe a number of them, and sometimes they even fought with one another. But what united them was this theocracy, and we'll speak about that at some length today, because 1 Samuel 4, which is our focus, is strongly focused on the Ark of the Covenant that was by this time at the community of Shiloh. And that's where Samuel, that's where Eli and his sons, Hoff, um, Phineas and Hophni were, were associated, and that's where Samuel was taken. We saw that already back in the book of Ruth. Because of the threat of the Philistines, who were administratively strong and militarily strong, they had a monopoly on the production of iron. And they would not let that secret out to the Israelites. Furthermore, the Israelites did not have the natural resource of much iron. And so whatever iron there was, <clears throat> was if you were going to reshape it, it had to be done by uh, Philistine craftsmen, ironmongers. That's why you get a reference in the, in the the prophets, you will turn your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. That means prepare for war. Give up on harvesting your crops. Alternately, in other prophets, you get you will turn your spears into pruning hooks and your swords into plowshares. That's a promise. This is going to end and we can return to caring for people, okay? War is expensive because it, it sends a whole bunch of the men who would be working otherwise in the fields and producing wealth and raising families. It sends them into war and they end up dead. It also diverts a lot of the resources. We experienced this, those of us who remember the time period of Vietnam, we tried to have a generous society and fight a major war at the same time, and you can't do it. That's how we ended up with terrible inflation as a result of that. So because the, the Philistines were so organized and economically powerful and militarily strong, they had chariots. And we're going to see on the maps that the Philistines, their area was on 
on a plain. It was on the coast. And it is extremely difficult, virtually impossible, to fight chariots when you're on foot with flint weapons. <coughs> and so the Israelites were threatened by this. Furthermore, the Palestinians, they are the descendants of the Philistines. They are the descendant, the direct descendants of the Philistines. So what's going on over in Israel today is about 3,000 years old. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Okay? When you have a loose confederation of tribes and no central leaders, it is extremely difficult to muster an army and to keep it to the task. And so the social political question arose as the Philistines were beginning to encroach on what was held by the Israelites up into the hills and toward the mountains. And the people began, we need a central leader. In the midst of this is Samuel. And Samuel should be seen as the last of the judges because he, he behaves just like one. But he is also an echo of Moses. Samuel is the first person who hears directly from the Lord in the same way that Moses did. None of the other judges were called that directly. Furthermore, Samuel is to be seen as a priest because of his service at Shiloh. He offers the offerings. Now, one of the things that you and I, many of us at least, were probably raised with or have the assumption, if an offering is made by an Israelite, it has to be conducted by a member of the tribe of Levi. That's ideal, but it's not necessarily the case. If some individuals were seen to be or called to be persons who were legitimate to offer the sacrifice, they did so. Samuel is not a member of the tribe of Levi. Nevertheless, he is a priest. So, this encroaching pressure of the Philistines creates the need for a new approach to governance in war. What about the tribes themselves at this time? And this is from the book of Judges. We know archaeologically that even though there was a central shrine at Shiloh, there were worship centers in, among every one of the tribes, either private or tribal. We have found them. And they existed not only in the hills and the mountains uh, of Canaan that the Israelites had taken over, they also existed on the other side of the Jordan or some of the tribes had taken control. A worship center becomes extremely important because it is the place where God's people gather, number one, and it's a central place. Number two, the worship center recounts how do we understand our faith and how should we be. That's why you and I come here once a week, at least. What is our faith, and how does that encourage us to be and to behave and to see things? They were limited in their occupation. We get this impression, maybe some from Sunday school, and some also from some of the triumphal language in the early part of the book of Joshua that as soon as the people came in, they took over all the land that subsequently would be ruled by King David. That is not historically true, and it's not even biblically true. And we're going to see what's going on in this, because on the one hand, there is this picture, we have, we have moved into the land. That's true but not totally. 
uh, because, and we'll see it. So you will see it in the weeks ahead in the story of King Saul. Uh, you have this 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 similar notion that Joshua and the and the Israelites killed everybody. Well, in many regards, what happened is there were distant relatives of the Israelites who had already taken over these cities. And they were not sure of what bound them together. And the Israelites come in, their distant relatives, and said, we just got back home from Egypt. Let us tell you what God has told us. And the distant relatives who had unseated their rulers, who were pagans, welcomed them with open arms. This sounds like a great idea. Can we be a part of you? Yes, you can. You also are part of the covenant. There were also persons of totally unrelated who, who embraced that or lived in the midst of it. I just noticed something. I've noticed it several times in recent weeks, reading about the current circumstance in the present nation of Israel. Did you know that 20% of the population of the present nation of Israel is not Jewish? It's either Christian, Druze, or Muslim. And they live at peace and prosper. They have freedom to vote and everything else. That's also the case at the time of the judges um, and the settlement of the territory. Some of the tribes are waning, like the tribe of Reuben. It's almost dying out. And the book of Judges and Joshua both describe some of those stories. In some areas, the Israelites got, you, you come in out of the desert, here's how we worship. And you come into an area now, it's a totally different culture. And uh, how do you raise crops? Oh, well, we have to harvest this here, or we plant this here, you have to prune the olives and the grapes in this way. Oh, okay, we, we haven't known that for generations. We're just shepherds. Uh, we would like to learn how to farm. And oh, by the way, in order to guarantee a good crop, you worship Baal and Astarte. Oh, OK. When in Rome, do as the Romans. And so besides that, Baal worship was, was totally sexual experience. Um, and that's a lot more interesting than page 5 and 15. And, and so, you know, all of a sudden, the worship doesn't look like it was supposed to. Um, the judges should be seen as local warlords. It is very much like we have in some of the parts of our cities. Could well be here. I have to ask Mark the next time I see him. And, and Brad, you may know this, too. But I know, yet I get the distinct impression that in larger cities, it's very much the case. There is certain turf claimed by certain gangs. And the leaders of those gangs, that's their turf. As I was thinking about this last night, I was inspired to go back and look at snippets of the, of the, of the movie The Godfather because that's exactly what it was like. These judges, many of them, should be seen just like the godfather. I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. OK? And sometimes they went to the mattresses and fought with one another. In point of fact, that's the way Kings in this time period should be understood. The king of Gaza, the king of Ashtoreth, the king of this area. It's a local warlord. It's a mafia don, is what it is. I've read the history of the mafia in Sicily. That's exactly what happened back then. But there is a faith understanding that's going on in this history, all of it, 
the Israelite faith is, if you fail to have faith and life in the Lord, in his decision, in his direction, it has consequences. We, that's a repeated pattern in the book of Judges. And the people began to do this. They worshiped Baal and they did this. And then the Lord allowed this other tribe to come in and to attack them. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then the people cried to the Lord and then the Lord raises up a judge. We will see that pattern repeated then You've seen the beginning of it in the, in the man Eli, whose sons were just terrible. By the time Samuel is old and they are thinking, we need a king, one of the reasons is Samuel wants to appoint his sons to replace him. And the people say, Samuel, your sons are vagabonds. We don't trust them. We want a king. Doesn't make sense because these guys are going to wreck the family business. Um, but we see it also in King Saul You will in the weeks ahead. When you don't live in faith and trust in the Lord and do it as he wants it done and think you have power to off, Saul was anointed as king. He was a not anointed as priest. And yet, in, in the chapters ahead, he will take it upon himself to make an offering because Samuel hasn't arrived yet. He has taken an authority that is not his. Personal note, take it for what it's worth. This is my objection personally to some of the language that we're using as we adapt our bylaws here at Christ Lutheran because they talk about the power we have as a congregation that we want to delegate to our lay leadership board. That's entirely legitimate for us to do that, except you and I do not have power, and neither do they. We have authority. Only the Lord has power. He loans it. And that's authority. But it's always under the Lord. And there's a, a, there's a to me personally, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in congregations. I see it happen in our nation. When we think we have the power, that's idolatry. We don't. We have authority. We have authority under the king of the universe who governs both nature and history. Thank you for listening. I feel better. <laughs> this time I will not raise an objection on the floor of the voters like I did last time. Let's talk about the importance of the shrine at Shiloh, not Tennessee. This is up in the mountains. It is north of Jerusalem and is about halfway. It is on the, the west side of the Jordan, up in the hills and mountains. It is about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. We will see it on a map shortly. The Jordan was crossed at Jericho, led by the ark. Joshua 3. At Gilgal, the covenant was reaffirmed, and all of the men who had been born in the wilderness at, that, at Gilgal were circumcised. They had not been circumcised in the wilderness. And so it's a total break, and the ark was there. The covenant, and the, they were reaffirming the covenant. After that, in Joshua 8, at Mounts Gerizim and Ebal, that will become extremely important for John chapter 4. 
because these two mountains are not in Judah. They are in Samaria. And they are the center of the political and, the and worship center of the Samaritans that were such a pain to the Jews. But at Mount Ebal and Gerizim, the covenant is renewed in Joshua chapter 8. And then, we are not told why or how, the Ark of the Covenant ends up a bit north of there at this community called Shiloh. Worship at Shiloh was not a matter of sacrifice. Some was offered there as it was in all, among all of the tribes at their own shrines. But what would happen ideally three times a year, but at least once a year if you were a devout Jew, you came to Shiloh to celebrate one of the feasts. There are three of them that are extremely important. There is a reference to that that you and I looked at some weeks ago in Ruth chapter 1 where Ruth's husband takes his entire family to Shiloh for the feast, probably the harvest feast at the end of the year. These feasts celebrated what the Lord had done to rescue his people. Let me tell you a little story quickly that helps understand that. When we lived in St. Louis for a few years, our daughter Rebecca became very good friends of the son of the Lutheran uh, Jewish pastor. He, had, he was Jewish, had been raised Jewish, became Christian and Lutheran. And there was a congregation of Jewish Lutheran people there, and they made use of the facility where we belonged in St. Louis. And because Becky was really good buddies with Ben, I think his name, wasn't it? Uh, on a couple of occasions, we were invited to join them for their festivities, one of which was Hanukkah one year. We came together, and, and it's a great experience. I mean, it's the same time of year as Christmas. So we were invited, and they, they celebrate all these Jewish customs associated with Hanukkah, but they, they as Christians. So after we had had a meal and people were cleaning things up, this other fellow, this other Jewish fellow and I, went outside to support the economy of North Carolina for a few minutes. <laughs> and I said, I want to tell you how great this is and what an honor to be invited and to enjoy this and see the roots of so many of our, our common Christian experience in this. He said, yeah. Every Jewish feast is based on the same theme. You tried to kill us. God kicked your butt. Let's eat. <laughs> That's a direct quotation. I, you know, I'm just reporting. <laughs> but it's true. And so when, when Ruth was brought to... Yeah, do I want to say Ruth? Yeah. No. I don't want to say Ruth. I want to say Hannah. I'm sorry. I apologize. In the first chapter of, of 1 Samuel, when Hannah was brought to Shiloh by her husband, this is for one of these things. And Hannah, as a faithful Jewess, is saying, God, you have forgotten me. And I am being assailed by my enemy, my co-wife, who makes fun of me because I don't have a child. And I'm distraught and empty and jealous and hurt and angry. Do not forget me. And the Lord listens and through Eli says, you will have a child, Samuel. Um, at Shiloh, the Ark of the Covenant is the focal point, and it recalls entirely the gracious actions of the Lord, because included within it were two stone tables 
the, the commandments were on them. Now, other texts in the scripture say the, the rod of Aaron was in there, the priest, the, the staff that indicates the authority of the priesthood, and a pot of manna, um, that, a recalling of God's provision in the wilderness. And those articles are to recall the way the Lord was then, and we are to be brought back to that and remember. If he was that way then, then he is still the same way now. What the presence of the ark demands is covenant faithfulness and trust in the Lord by those who are following the Lord. Because when, when those events took place, whether it's the story of the, the, the plagues in Egypt and the, the exodus journey through the wilderness, or whether it's the story of Queen Esther and the Feast of Purim, all of these, or whether it's the story of Hanukkah and the lighting of the candles that miraculously, according to the story and or legend, stayed lit. It is the Lord who provides. Don't go playing games with it. Trust. It's like the old gospel song. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Through the, through the exodus, the ark led the way, and it went before the people by the Lord's command. During the conquest under Joshua, the ark led the way by the Lord's command. The ark in 1 Samuel 4 became seen as a talisman. You know that word? It means we can pick this up and carry it out and magically we'll win because we control the ark. No, you don't. All it is is a reminder of the presence of the Lord and how he cared for you in the past. Now, I do not know if you've read 1 Samuel 4 already or not. Uh, but real quickly, let's take a scan of it. The Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites encamped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. That will become important. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated. And they killed about 4,000 of them. On the, on, so they returned to camp discouraged. And why did the Lord uh, bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of the enemies. So they bring it from Shiloh to this battlefield. It's, it's about, the battlefield is kind of like north and west, some distance from Shiloh. When the ark comes into the camp, verse uh, 5, Israel just, yay, it's here. Now we've got the magical thing. Um, and the Philistines are shaken by this. So God has come and said, we've got to, you know, we got to knuckle down. we gotta, we got to fight. So verse 10, uh, 10, the Philistines fought. The Israelites were defeated. Every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Um, I'll catch the rest of the chapter when we come to the comfort section of today. In 1 Samuel 4, the ark, seen as kind of this, hey, we can control this, it was going to guarantee victory. It did not have the Lord's command. They just thought they controlled it. Let me remind you of something we're doing next Sunday. We're going to call a pastor to serve in sanctuary. A name is being offered that, humanly speaking, our Pastor Echo Camp and all the rest of the staff and the call committee believe this would be a very helpful individual. 
you and I need to pray and listen next week when they report. You and I need to be convinced of that. You and I need to be convinced of that because they do not have the authority to call. We do. This is given to the church. And we need to be convinced of it. Is this the Lord's will? Okay? And we need to be open to them. And we do need to look at all the human pieces of this. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Entirely appropriate. But we need to be convinced because when these men come into our midst, Pastor Schnocky, Pastor Echelkamp, Pastor Hutton, Pastor Scheint, and those who are training for it, like Vicar Cassidy, they speak for the Lord. We may call them by their first name. We may readily know their faults. God knows you know mine. Like, I'm, I get angry. <laughs> I get silly. That's not humanity. But we are a community of faith around the word of the Lord, not people. No matter how much we do or don't like them, they are the spokesmen for the Lord. And we seek to follow the Lord. We need to be convinced in our hearts, yes, Lord, we believe this is the one to whom we should extend a call. Now, it does not become official until he's installed. Once he's installed, assuming he accepts our call, assuming we're convinced to extend it to him. It's the same with anybody in government office. We don't play games with that stuff. Okay, we vote our conscience. We, I pointed out to you, they have attacked at AFEC. I will show you that on a map because it's significant. Note also, the Israelites went out to fight. There's no king to lead them. And Samuel's not there. So this is a tribal effort to resist the Philistines. Eli's sons are involved in this, and we've already seen how scurrilous they are. The ark is captured, and Eli, at the shock of the, of the death of his sons and the loss of the ark, he falls off his chair and breaks his neck. And then Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, um, gives birth prematurely to their son and names him Ichabod, meaning the glory of the Lord is no more. Let's look at this. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. I think this is an approximate number, but I think it's significant, because four is the number of humanity. Three is the number of God. 1,000 means all of all of all. What it's saying is they, they put their hope in their military, and their military was defeated. And when the people came to camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Don't forget, you make decisions contrary to the Lord, and it has consequences. The Lord didn't command you to go out there. A man of Benjamin significant, that's the tribe that Saul comes from, ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn. What does it mean when you tear your clothes as a Jew? Mourning. That's right. It's not just from battle. He was grieving. And he has dirt or dust on his head. This is significant. Because when dust is thrown or taken on, it means I'm a nobody. We 
are a nobody, we are lost. In fact, there is an ancient word in the Semitic language, a pyro, which some believe is associated with the word Hebrews. All through the culture of the Middle East, Hapiru were mercenaries. They were nobodies. And the Hebrews were considered that just dust, blown in out of the wilderness. And so this man, by putting dust on him, is saying, we are lost. I, am, I have no strength. I'm just getting blown around. That's not unknown to us. How many of you remember the language of this particular song? I close my eyes only for a moment and the moment's gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes, a curiosity. Dust in the wind. All they are is dust in the wind. You remember that haunting melody, some of you, from the 60s? Same old song, just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground, though we refuse to see. It's by Carrie Livgren. Dust in the wind, all we are is dust in the wind. How often do you and I not feel powerless over things? You know why? Because we are. One time I was speaking to my spiritual advisor years ago. And I said, Howard, I, I really discouraged. I just feel so incompetent. He said, Dirk, there's a reason for that. I said, what's that? He said, you are incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> this is called humility. <laughs> OK. Um, and it is this feeling of helplessness over things. How often have you and I not felt that, both in our individual lives and these days in our cultural, historical life? I think I got a couple of slides mixed up here. I want to jump ahead to one. Here. Psalm 103, he, the Lord, knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. When do we read that? At funerals. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. When do we say those words? Ash Wednesday, as we put the ashes on your forehead. <laughs> One time on Ash Wednesday, there were like four of us doing ashes. All the students are coming up. Chapel was packed, you know. They're coming up in Dust Yard. We kind of, after about the 50th student on each side, we began to get bored and put tic-tac-toe on their foreheads. <laughs> Here's what I want you to see. Yes, we are dust. And we're, we're scattered to the wind. Who's going to remember us after we're gone? The Lord does. And he doesn't do it because we pry something out of him. He does it for the, for the sake of his own glory. Phineas' wife named her newborn son Ichabod. The glory has departed because her husband was dead, her brother-in-law, her, her father-in-law, the ark was lost, all is lost. God's glory has departed because what she could see and hold on to wasn't there. Who was still there? The Lord was. That's what we need to recall and be recalled to. That's why these passages are chosen. God's name, Yahweh, the Lord, 
his being, and all that he does, they all operate together. Isaiah, for my own name's sake, for my reputation, the Lord says, you don't make it happen, I do. For my own reputation's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you so as not to cut you off. I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. And we will see this in about two chapters, because after the Philistines capture the ark, they take it to their chief city and put it in the temple of their god Dagon. The god Dagon was guaranteeing, was worshipped in order to guarantee economic plenty, and it was, he was not like Baal and Astarte, far more sophisticated. But the other thing that, that Dagon guaranteed was kingship. And that gets mixed into this whole thing of Israel crying for a king. And they begin to depend on the king as the answer instead of the Lord. Um, and so the ark is there, and the next day the Philistines come into their temple, and what do they find? You men remember? The god Dagon is face down, worshiping the ark of the covenant. So they set Dagon back up, and the next day they come in, the god is smashed. My glory, I will not yield to another, but you can't manipulate it either. Because the Lord operates by grace. By grace. From Ezekiel, this gets repeated three times in the same chapter. For the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations they lived among in whose sight I had revealed myself to the Israelites by bringing them out of Egypt. We have been born out of Egypt. You and I have been delivered from sin, death, and the power of the devil. The Lord has done that. The rest of this stuff is peripheral piffle. The Lord's got it. He does not have to prove that to you, and we can't manipulate it, and we don't need to. Trust and obey. The failure of faith and life in the Lord has consequences, whether you're a king, a priest, judge, or a commoner. The Lord will not suffer manipulation because he operates by grace. Now this is very possibly, here's a rendition of what the Ark of the Covenant might have looked like. Or this is another possibility. But here are the maps. Here's the Sinai. Right here is Gaza. <laughs> Where they're fighting this morning or tonight there. <coughs> the Israelites came in through here. Here's Moab and Ammon. And they came in across the Jordan about here. You can see that all of this is mountainous. Jerusalem is up in here in the mountains at an elevation of about 2,500 feet above sea level. Within miles is the Dead Sea, and that's below sea level. So this is extremely mountainous territory. It gets steeper as it goes north, but look right in here. You can see, you see that area? That's, that's hill country where the plains come into the hills, so it's more level. That's where Aphek is, that town that the Philistines fought the Israelites at. The Philistine com community was down here on the coast where it's very flat. Furthermore, there is an ancient highway through here. And the Philistines put their cities right on it so they could control the highway and tax the people coming through. Kind of like 
Illinois building tollways that we paid for to begin with in the interstate system. And you get up in here to the Sea of Galilee, and up here is Mount Hermon. That's 7,200 feet above, above sea level. And it is in this area here that the Israelites settled and down in here. That gives you another picture of it. Here's Jericho that they, where they came across in a little town of I. Here's Jerusalem up in the mountains. Never conquered during the time of Joshua the judges. It will become significant. Shiloh is up about here. This area, the Sinai, until the time of, you know, early in this time, this was all controlled by the Egyptians. That's why the Israelites, when they flee, they go all the way down and they come up this way to avoid conflict with the Egyptians who still have some control in that. But here is the land of Canaan where ancient enemies of the Egyptians had ruled. They fought a number of wars against them. As we move into subsequent chapters, we are invited by some of the authors that kind of the prevailing opinion at this point is that the story in First and Second Samuel is less a story of David coming to his throne as much as it is a story of the conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. Who's going to let, who's going to win? This is very much like after Queen Elizabeth I died, childless, and there was a major war between two royal dynasties in England, the War of the Roses. Um, which one's going to win out? Because Shiloh is right here. This circle is the area that Samuel visited every year as judge. And right in here is where the Benjaminites settled. And Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. You can see there are other tribes up into this area here. So that this area, there's Ebal and Gerizim, and there's Shechem. Very important because Abraham resided at Shechem. So the ancestry is right in here. And here David is from the tribe of Judah. He's down here. What do people in far western Nebraska feel about people who live in the large population centers of eastern Nebraska? Do they trust them? Why? We're Nebraskans. We had a Hoosier among you. <laughs> Regional mistrust. Why is the district office in Seward? When I first came here, it was in Omaha. And they didn't trust that. But it's way in the east. Number two, it's right down the hall from the office of the LCA. We got to move it out where it's more centrally located. So I move it to Seward? <laughs> you know how that happened? The same reason the college is out there. That whole town and that, that, that congregation knows how to pull strings. Plain and simple. If you're going to sinfully locate the district office, where should you put it? Kearney. So when David becomes king, very smart, one of his first things is to conquer Jerusalem. And it's called the city of David because he's the first Israelite to take control of it. And then he brings the Ark of the Covenant. By this time, it's no longer at Shiloh and hasn't been for a generation. It's been down here. 
He brings it into Jerusalem. And you centralize church and state. And he controlled it all. By the way, when the tribes break away after the death of Solomon, it's this area here that becomes Judah. This becomes Israel. And that's partly political and tax-wise. I spoke about this already, not going to talk. I spoke about this. This really borders into some more things in the anointing of Saul, his choice. I'm not going to get into it, but here's where I want to close today. I think the theological point, especially when you and I face the fact that we feel sometimes like dust, just dust. By the way, what's one of the phrases that Pastor Ecclecamp regularly says to individuals? He gets in our face and says, you matter. Some of my friends who are in science say, all you are is matter. No, you matter. You may not feel like it. But what we're being challenged to is to have faith and live our life in the Lord. Because when we don't, it has consequences. Whether you're a king or a commoner. And you are not commoners. You are sons and daughters of the king. You're princes and princesses. Uh, I'm not going to steal somebody's thunder in two weeks. Okay. <laughs> the Lord brought it back because they thought they could control it. And so two chapters later, the Lord sends a bubonic plague on them. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor. You don't know what to call me, do you? Did you put them up to this? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>